Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining me today. If you couldn't tell from the title already, uh, we're going to be taking a look at Seth Klarman's newest interview with Harvard Business School here in 2022. Just recently did it not too long ago. Um, and also different background than where I'm normally at. I just want to see what this looks like. And, you know, maybe there might be someone might have a reaction to it. But with that being said, we're going to jump in, get some value investing principles, get some value investing ideals. I have three key points that I really want to go over that he had uh, talked about in this interview. But there's obviously a ton of other things that if you can find this interview, at least find the transcript for it, um, make sure to just read through it because I really do think that it was uh, very insightful to hear someone like him talk through what he's seeing in the market, talk through what he's experiencing, and really just seeing how calm, cool, and collected he is and just... He, he walks through a lot of other things too outside of just the initial investing. It's really more so just running a business and what that's looking like in this environment. So with that being said, I'm not going to hold this over in long. Let's jump right into it. All right. So first things first, I just have like four slides that we're going to go through. I'm going to talk on some of these points and then we'll kind of get to it. So the first one that he touched on was market inefficiencies. And the quote that I grabbed was, two things happen in markets. Right markets are inefficient, partly because of human nature, as mentioned, greed and fear. People get greedy and panic. In some cases, the panic is legitimate. Oh crap, I leveraged my portfolio, I'm getting margin called, or I have short-term clients and they can redeem and I'm getting redeemed and I have to sell whether I like it or not. There are other constraints on investors that also create inefficiencies. Once in a while, we get a call from someone with one asset in their private equity fund who want to raise the next fund. They want to book a gain on the asset and so call, and so and call it last asset phenomena. People will literally sell that more urgently and maybe they'll favor getting it done over the exact price that they get because they want to raise their next fund and move on. They want to book a gain and get paid. We live in an imperfect world and their clients would probably not love that, but maybe their clients would love that. The manager has a lot of things to balance. So that's just one little example. When a bond gets downgraded, there's always an immediate rush to the exit by the investment grade holders. A bond gets downgraded to junk, say when the bond goes literally from triple B to double B. Many bonds have to get sold. Some are probably sold in advance and it's good to know what a company does, its operations and its worth. It's also interesting to know that there's a very large seller and the bonds are 20 points lower with essentially no change in any information, just the rating of a 26 year old at Moody's. So those are the kinds of things that can trigger our interest than we do fundamental work. So let's, um, let's kind of break out the first piece. So the greed in the panic, and he's saying that this drives a lot of, um, really just drives a lot of inefficiencies in the market because you know, you'll have a company that's worth, let's say a billion dollars. Suddenly it gets dropped. The market drops it to $500 million. So that's a 50% loss. But really the fundamentals are pointing to a, it stayed the same. And that valuation of a billion was correct. And as well as it's growing. So the value is growing, but the market is, you know, pulling back its own um, pricing. So that's why I wanted to show you on the right, this graph here. And it shows really like when you have sort of the Mr. Market that Buffett likes to talk about, and it goes way below what the intrinsic value is, um, you're able to buy with more safety. And that's kind of what he's going to reiterate throughout this whole entire um, piece. But he goes on to say about how private equity funds are just trying to build up the next fund and really how that causes an inefficiency where they're just trying to get rid of an asset so that way they can just move on. Um, and they'll sell it even at a lower price than what they really could get it for. So it's one of those things where you're buying a dollar for 50 cents or buying a dollar for 75 cents when you, the investor, know that it's worth a dollar, but the person selling it is just selling it for 50 cents to either just get out their books or they don't want it anymore or they're just trying to move on and get to the next asset. And then lastly, he talks about bonds and obviously they cast a wide net over at Balpest Group, um, but really how you, you have a company that issues a bond this bond gets downgraded and a lot of funds, especially more so like retirement and pension funds, hold bonds. And what happens is when it gets downgraded, if it goes from investment grade to junk, all of a sudden they have to sell off. Or even if there's a, a bond requirement within their um, portfolio, so if it goes from, you know, A to triple A or triple A to A, you know, whichever way it moves, um, it changes how the portfolio is structured because they might have constraints on how they how much they need to hold. So he says that finding these inefficiencies is really where um, him and his groups thrive and where you make a lot of money. And the thing is, is that he does this with a margin of safety. He makes sure to invest into things where even if it goes down 20 more percent, he built that into his pricing that he originally bought at. So it's one of those things where if it keeps going down, the fundamentals remain. It's a good, it's a, you know, it's a good sale. So, you know, kind of going into that. 
next you have the silo effect. So he said, we dig very deep. Our approach is let's look a mile wide. Let's look at everything. And then we can possibly figure out. And then we find something that looks like it might be a bargain and inefficient pricing. pricing and then we go a mile deep. Gillian Ted of the Financial Times wrote a book called The Silo Effect. And she talks about the good things and the bad things when that soil you when you know a certain kind of company or you only know 20 stocks well, problem is that it's the hammer and nail problem. You know those things really well, but you don't know anything about anything else. You have no perspective to say, well, this is the best of those biotech stocks that I look at, but maybe even the best of them is not nearly as good as those stocks over there. The silo effect hamstrings investors. One way to describe how we think about portfolio is that we look between the silos. We look for cracks and the things leaking out. We look for things that can't be easily siloed. There are fewer competitors in those. And if there's one thing I love, it's the lack of competition. So he, he really points to um, what happens is in funds, you have, you know, you'll have an analyst who's just focused on, let's say, the semiconductor industry, and they might just focus on the top five semiconductor players by market cap. So you'll have this weird instance where, you know, someone might be, you know, it's the best semiconductor you can buy. Well, the best semiconductor is good buy, but that doesn't mean it's the best opportunity for your money. And the whole idea is you're supposed to allocate capital correctly and allocate it to the best opportunity. So he, he's mentioning how you know you have a lot of funds where they focus on one specific thing or they focus on one specific industry where they might not have knowledge of a different industry. And the thing is, is that um, when you intentionally silo yourself versus avoiding something because you don't understand it and it's not in your circle of competence, those are two different things. When you intentionally put yourself kind of in a box and say, I'm not going to invest in anything else besides semiconductors, what happens is, is you can get hurt because you're not capturing the best opportunity. You might just be capturing the best opportunity within the semiconductors. And if you look at something like the EV market where you have Tesla and Neo and all these other big players, and as well as all the legacy auto manufacturers getting into EVs, it's really hard to say which one is the best opportunity. And you know, people will argue one way or the other, and I'm not gonna argue about which EV is better, but the thing is is that you look at just the EV sector and you try to decide which one's the best EV, when in reality, they could all be grossly overpriced relative to the market and not be the best opportunity for compounding your wealth. So that's really what he's saying here, and they like that, they like the idea of where you know, you're investing into things that don't have a lot of analysts following it. You don't have a lot of competition getting into that company and actually buying that business because that's where the money is made when there's no one really looking at it and it's off to the side here. And, you know, everyone's looking at Tesla, but no one's looking at a different um, opportunity that's not involved in EVs. It might just be a boring, you know, grocery store or manufacturing company that no one really cares about. Those are where the opportunities are made and where the money's made. And that, that's, I think, Buffett says that a lot. Peter Lynch says that a lot. Klarman says that a lot. You'll see a lot of other value investors that mention that as well. So I thought it was interesting that he had mentioned that because he, he really harped on how important it was, how important it was to really um, avoid this silo effect. So the last key piece that I want to mention is the risk versus volatility. And he kind of goes into what risk truly is and what volatility and noise really is. So he says, if you don't think about every investment as having a margin of safety, this means you buy at a discount and leave room for error, misjudgment, and bad luck because things happen in the world and happen in investing. COVID 2020 happened. No one expected that to happen except for, you know, maybe a few people who had saw it coming. He said, I think in Warren Buffett's parlance, he says, when you build a bridge, you might plan to be driving, you know a certain kind of truck over it, but you build it so it can handle five times as much weight as that just in case. And that's what you should do with investments. So you never lose sight of the downside. When other people buy a very flashy growth stock at a very high multiple, we're probably looking for a more sedate investment that will make less or maybe won't make less and will protect the downside in the heat of the last couple of years. That saw stocks rocket to new highs almost every day. We feel our investments are completely solid, so I think that's not to choose one or the other. It's always to remember both getting your capital back and trying to make a return. If I had to choose one of those, I'd always choose to get your capital back because you live to play another day. And losing money is a real challenge because it's very hard to make it back. You may get margin calls or debt coming due, so you always want to be thinking about not blowing up and not getting too far over your skis. 
When you focus on return at the exclusion of risk, you try to get more risk to get the return. You get the risk, but you may or may not get the return. You focus first on risk and mitigate and or avoid or reduce the risk, then you've protected the downside and then maybe you get the return. So really the overall thing that he's saying here is investing with a margin of safety on something that you believe has value in order to protect your downside. So if something you know, is way below your margin of safety, that's probably a good buy if you understand the business and you like the prospects going forward. There are some times where, you know, something's growing rapidly. And the thing is, is that the higher the multiple, the bigger the risk that you're taking into this company. Because if it doesn't justify a multiple, it's not gonna go anywhere. If you look at something like Intel, Intel, you know, went up crazy in 2001. And since 2001, it has tripled its revenue and I think doubled or tripled its earnings. And it's still not back to the price that it was at back in 2001. It's 20 some odd years later. So it's really important that when you invest into things that you look at the long term, long term horizon and understand where the business is going and understanding that you are buying a business. The volatility and the noise of a stock price and a stock ticker going up and down, that doesn't matter as far as, you know, you owning the business. You should look at it as owning a business. The risk is, is that the business doesn't do well, the business doesn't return capital, and that the business doesn't grow. That is the risk of investing. And really the most important thing here is, is that when you're getting into a company, you wanna make sure that you don't lose money. And that's the whole, you know, Warren Buffett's rule of there's two rules in investing. Rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one kind of thing. And I really do think that that is the most important thing is protecting your wealth and protecting your capital. Ultimately, you wanna grow it, but if you invest with the risk going in to begin with, rather than just looking at returns, you'll actually be able to get long-term returns over the coming years. And the thing is that a lot of people focus on, oh, if I go high risk, I get high returns, which in some cases may be correct and probably on an empirical basis probably is correct. But the thing is, is that as a value investor, you're looking for low risk, high return situations. And the real reality is if your neighbor's getting, you know, 2Xing his, his stocks year over year over year, and you're over here getting 20%, 15%, that's still really good to compound at 15, 20% a year. And I think a lot of people ignore that. And I think that's to the, the deficit of an investor. So focus on your own returns, your investing principles, and really what that means to you. And that's kind of what he reiterated through this entire um, sort of lecture interview sort of thing. So really the key takeaways for me is buy value, buy businesses, don't just buy the story, hopes, and a ticker. You're buying into a business. Do you understand the business? Do you understand where it's at currently? Do you understand what cycle it's in? Do you understand the valuation? Do you understand and feel confident in your own valuation and buying it? As well as invest with the margin of safety and make sure to recheck your work. So let's say you buy a company at $100 and it goes down to 80. Recheck to make sure you didn't miss anything. Was there a reason it went down to 80? Or is this just, you know, the company, people aren't happy with the prospects because it's not growing at 100%, it's growing at 20%, it's growing at 25%, it's growing at 15%. A lot of times when things change in a company as far as growth rates and things like that, people get so mad and just sell off and you'll see it on YouTube and you'll see it on Instagram and Reddit and all these places where you see all the stock market stuff, people just get mad and they just sell off and go, I don't wanna deal with this anymore when they claim to be long-term investors. So make sure to recheck your work and understand what you're investing in. Um, focus on what your investment goals are and not what your neighbor is doing across the street. So again, that's what I mentioned earlier, focus on your own investment principles, your own investment goals and what that means to you. Because ultimately you are investing for yourself. Your neighbor can do whatever they want to do. If they're doubling their money every year, cool. Let them do that. But focus on your own wealth and your own compounding because the important thing is that you don't want to lose money. So the last thing is avoid the noise from the media and the news outlets. Instead, focus on your business and where you see it going in the future. So that's all I have for today. Let me know if you have any interesting takes down below. If you were able to watch the interview before it got pulled, let me know what your thoughts were. And if you found any other points, I had a bunch of notes from it. I just, these were the three that I really liked. So with that being said, if I find the interview, I'll make sure to post a link to it. I don't, I'll be able to, it seems like the copyright striking it. But with that being said, thank you all for joining me today. Don't forget to subscribe and like the video. Have a great day and happy investing.